time is the most precious commodity and you're wasting it looking at your phone. You should be paying attention to your son. And, um, and, and his reaction, his first reaction, like it would be mine. is like, she thinks she is. I'm a great dad. Like that's the first reaction he had. Yeah. And then he gets in the car and he's like, you know what? Like, I need to be better. I need to do better. Hi, I'm brilliant. Your host for this show. I know that I'm incredibly blessed. As the son of self-made billionaires, I've seen the high price some people pay for success, and I've learned that money really can't buy happiness. But I've also had the good fortune to learn directly from many of the world's leading teachers. If you're ready to be, do, have, and give more, this podcast is for you. It goes without saying that you can learn a lot about success by studying the lives and habits of successful people. Some people who are successful are actually pretty good at articulating principles that they have used to achieve their success. My guest today is one such person. His name is Scott O'Neill. Let me tell you a little bit about what he has accomplished professionally. He's a best-selling author. He's an award-winning sports business executive and leader. He's the former CEO of Harris Blitzer Sports and Entertainment. He's a 25-year tenured NBA, NFL, and NHL senior executive, and he's a Harvard Business School alum. He was a straight-A student, president of a student body, captain of three sports teams, and even president of the local National Honor Society, so he has been on a path of success for a very, very long time. I interviewed him because he wrote a book called Be Where Your Feet Are, Seven Principles to Keep You Present, Grounded, and Thriving. I have seen that these are not necessarily the conversations that executives in corporate America are having, but Scott is. For that reason, I find him very interesting. And I enjoyed his book a lot. In this conversation, we cover many things related to not only achieving success, but living well. I'll just give you a little heads up that there's one challenge related to gratitude that Scott issues you in this interview, and I myself am taking on as well. So you can listen for that. If you want to learn more about Scott and his work, you can follow him on Twitter at Scott O'Neill, and you can find him on LinkedIn. So with that, I hope you enjoy this conversation with my new friend, Scott O'Neill. Scott, welcome to the School for Good Living. I'm thrilled to be here. I, I, you know, we were talking before we hopped on about just, I just love your story, Brilliant. I love your mission and vision to bring good living to the world. Um, I think the world's struggling right now. I think mental health challenges that are at an all-time high. I think in five years from now, we'll be talking about this as an an absolute epidemic in this country. And so I'm very interested in the topic. I I love that you've taken this on to to drive change in the world. And I'm I'm humbled and privileged to be here. Well, thank you. I'm glad you're here. Will you tell me, please, what is life about? Life for me is about my family, my faith. And trying to leave a dent in the world, I, um, I have this compelling why for myself. And um, I'm not sure what life's about for other people, but uh, for me, life's about, one, helping develop the next generation of leaders. I think it's a lost art. I think leadership is, is something that we are sorely lacking in the sports and entertainment industry, in the publishing industry, and in the world at large. And so I that part of my why is helping to develop that next gen of extraordinary leaders. And, and that's, it helps me pop out of bed in the morning. And the other, you know, I've been fortunate enough to be part of some pretty big platforms. You know, I've been in the sports business since I could uh, uh, stop crawling. And, uh, you know, I've worked in the NBA, the NFL, National Hockey League. I've worked in leagues and teams at Madison Square Garden in this big platform. And I, I, I found out really quickly that these platforms, you know, if leveraged properly, can, can make the world better. And so for me, I, I, I look at the cities where we live, work and play and, and the, the job I just just left um, HBSC, the Sixers and Devils, et cetera. We built a big business. You know, we were in Camden, New Jersey, which is um, the murder capital of the United States and has a household income of around thirteen thousand dollars. Seventy five percent of the households are, are single parent families and they've got open air drug markets and gangs. And, and boy, what an opportunity to, to drive change and make a difference. And uh, I also worked in Newark, New Jersey, which is a, a really tough emerging city for sure, but a, but a tough place. And then Philadelphia is the second highest poverty rate of any major U.S. city. So, so I had three incredible opportunities um, to work with an organization to drive change. And sports does hold a special place, whether that's right or wrong. 
I'm not here to judge. <clears throat> I just know that when you're in that business, people respond to you. You have access. You have access to politicians. You have access to companies. You have access to money. And you can impact the youth because they're looking at you. And, um, and I'll just tell one quick story and I'll get off this point. But, um, you know, I was uh, speaking to a, a, a youth group. We put on this incredible camp in Canada, which it sounds so like almost silly to talk about, but it was a free basketball camp. And so we, we brought in 300 kids a year. And the first thing we do is give them new sneakers. And I don't think any of these kids had ever, ever had new sneakers in their life because it was as if it was Christmas morning. And we give them a basketball and, you know, jerseys and tees and, you know, uh, young boys and young girls. And uh, then we bring in some current players, some ex-players, and then we have our, our team put on a camp. And I, I always had the opportunity to go speak to the, to the kids. And, and I always, you know, would say, you know, I, I grew up, <clears throat> you know, in a, in a fascinating environment myself. So I said, you know, I, I've seen a lot of people emerge from really tough situations. And, and some of the commonalities of that are, you know, hard, hard work. There's no substitute for work. It just isn't like you work on reasonably hard. You have a chance that you're an extraordinary teammate. So, so you're, you're not afraid to reach out because you're, you're doing your teammate work yourself. And the third thing is that you have a vision for a better future. And then I turned it over to the kids, which is the most dangerous thing at a young age. And I said, what do you want? What is your vision for your future? And, and what I was hoping I wasn't going to hear was I'm going to play for the Sixers. I'm going to play for the Devils. I'm going to play for the Philadelphia Eagles. I didn't want to hear it. And um, out of the 300 kids, I probably heard from 60 of them who raised their hands. And it was, it was authentic. It was, I want to be an Air Force pilot. I want to be a firefighter. I want to join the electrician's union. And I was like, I, I will tell you, like, I was pretty blown away. And then it got to the end. We had one, one hey, I want to play in the NFL. And then we had a, a, a little gal. She's probably the smallest. She, I probably could have picked her up and put her in my pocket. She was so little. And she said, um, well, I want to be a singer. And I said, uh, do you sing at your church? And she said, I sure do, Mr. O'Neill. I said, Scott, it's fine. She said, well, I sure do, Scott. I said, do you want to come out here and, and sing with us now? Which is like, you would never do that in front of a group because you're risking fiasco, right? Uh, but I can't help myself. She says, uh, I'd love to. Wow. And she gets up. It was during the whole um, frozen phase like that. You know, let it go. So she gets up and she sings, let it go. And the whole gym starts singing with her. Wow. And I, I will tell you, like, it's moments like that, that, that bring you peace in that all the angst you go through, all the long nights, all like the, the work and the, all those fires that you're putting out, you're looking at these 300 kids and you say, hey, for at least a week, you know, maybe we provided a little bit of shelter from the rain. And maybe we provided a little hope they wouldn't have had. And maybe we made a little bit of difference that a couple of those um, kids get out and realize their dreams. But it was like, that's the kind of thing. That's my purpose. That's my why. That's the meaning of, of why I uh, am so excited to get up in the morning. Yeah. That's awesome. And, and I am with you there on the power of, of sports, you know, for good and being able to, to work with a community, you know, with the players and touch a community and, and just help people move closer to reaching their, their full potential. It's really remarkable. And, and sometimes it's easy for me to, to get down on it, especially with maybe the negativity or the, 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 what I would call the dark side of competition. You know, sometimes when I would go to jazz games, especially when I was younger, people would be so angry, like at yeah. what was going on at the refs or the opposing team. And I would just think, man, if people are that upset, there's probably something going on in their life. But when I stand back and look at the big picture and hear stories like the one you're sharing, I'm reminded of how, how wonderful that can be. Yeah, I agree. I, I have, I've seen my fair share of angry crowds and, and been on the, uh, the receiving end of some pretty nasty reddits and, and Twitter posts. And all I can say is that like, sports, like, we have a special place in the world right now, right now, like our purpose, like as a, as an industry is to build community where there isn't. Yeah. And to lift people up when they need it and to provide some escapism when the rest of the world is heavy. And, and we, we need sport. We need entertainment. We need live entertainment. We need music. We need to go and scream and clap and cheer and hug perfect strangers and, and be frustrated at losses or bad calls and celebrate when a big shot goes in because yeah. we've been grinding for 18 months. Yeah. And with this Delta variant, I, I don't know if there's like a real end in sight. Like I, 
I think we're going to grind for another six, eight months. And, and so, so we have to do what we can to make sure that we can provide that place where you can come and feel part of something special. Yeah, absolutely. Let me ask you a question that I get asked a lot, but I think you're probably much more qualified to answer, which is people who aspire to work in this, in professional sports, they know they're not going to play on the field or on the court, but they want to have a role maybe in the front office or something. Um, what do you recommend to people who have these aspirations? Well, you know, I, I first say like, if you want to sell, I'll hire you tomorrow. That's what I say. That's the first thing I say. And that eliminates at least 60% of the people. Um, because at the end of the day, I mean, there are a lot of entry level jobs that you can do in this, in this business. Um, but the easiest way in is to go sell tickets. Yeah. It's old school. It's old school boiler room. And I, and I think five years from now, we won't see that as much anymore as, as direct to consumer marketing um, starts to, to um, kind of lay, lay its big groundwork on that business. I think it's going to transform the business, but, but I, I, I will say that this next gen, like in particular, the young people would, I, um, I'm sure the people are asking you, the, the 40% of them want to be your general manager, you know, and, and that, that is, it's not that it, it can't happen. It's just the likelihood doesn't match my time horizon. You know, I, I don't have 300 years on this earth. So, so for me, I, I like to get people and get them in. And what, what I would say is, look, we have the best managers in the world. We will give you the best training in the world. We will develop your mind, body, and soul. We will make you your whole self. We'll help you grow up. And then you can decide if you want to be in this business or take your talents to, to do something else. Um, but I, I love that promise. I love this next gen. I love these young kids coming up. I think the world is in really good hands. They're really smart, a lot smarter than we were um, growing up. They're much more connected. They understand their brands. They understand our brands. They're willing to work, um, but they do expect a couple of things. One is they expect access to everything. Yeah. They expect full transparency. They expect to be in the corner office by the second week. But the, th the fourth thing that they expect, which I absolutely love, is they hold executives like myself accountable for what you believe. Like, what do you stand? Scott, what do you stand for? I want to know. How does that manifest itself? Are you willing to post? Like, we got a, we got a revolution going on in this country. What are you going to do? What does this company stand for? And, and there are so many issues that are important to so many people. It's hard as an executive in an organization to figure out, okay, well, what are we going to stand for? What, what am I going to put out there? What is the organization? Where does, where does it stop? Yeah. Um, on the other hand, I think it's amazing because they're saying they don't have cars. They don't have houses. So they're like, yeah, this isn't for me anymore. And I kind of respect that. Like I could never do it. Like I, you know, you know, I, I've been out of work, out of luck and out of money a couple of times. And, and I have a, you know, I have a fear of being broke, a fear, you know? So I couldn't just raise my hand and walk away. I just couldn't do it without a parachute. And these kids are like, I'm good. And I was like, Hey, you don't have to go anywhere. Like you can stay like, you're good. Like, I, I love you. You're going to be great. Like, yeah, I'm going to take off. And I have a lot of respect for, for the courage, for the vision and, and for the, like that, this group of young people, they see the world so differently and so purely and so um, altruistically. They, they, they understand that our generation has made some mistakes. And we would say the same thing about our parents' generation and our grandparents' generation. And we keep getting better and we keep getting smarter and we keep making better decisions. Uh, but this group coming up, the world will be a better place. It'll be very different. Yeah. You know, and, and we saw that with Bernie Sanders getting so many votes. You know, like this is a different group of people um, who see the world very differently and very, in a very special way. Uh, but, I, but I think we're in for an incredible run over the next 50 years in this country. Yeah, I think you're right. I think we probably truly can't imagine 50, 50 years what, what the world in this country are going to look like. Um, one thing that gives me hope is that more and more leaders, leaders like you, are talking about things that, that I think matter deeply. And one of those is, is mindfulness. And, and with the book you've written, Be Where Your Feet Are, even right there in the title, right? In the subtitle, Seven Principles to Keep You Present, Grounded, and Thriving. I want to ask you a bit about this book, but before, before I do, or maybe as the way to get into it, I want to ask about a story you tell in the book about a time that you invited your executives to participate in a mindfulness exercise, I think on a forward, you call it a forward. Go, go forward. Because we don't repeat. 
Yeah. yeah cool. No retreat. Will you talk yeah. about what that was like and why you did it and what came of it? Sure. You know, there's a, um, a, a dear friend of mine is a guy named Pat Croce, who uh, was a former owner of the Sixers and ran, had a very similar job that, that I had. He ran, ran the organization for years. And, uh, and he left this, this rat race and effectively uh, went full time. He, he, he opened a bunch of restaurants and he's like, I'm not really passionate about it. I want to get into mindfulness. And so, so that's what he's about. So, so he introduced me to, uh, you know, one of the local universities um, and their, their leading mindfulness um, professors. And they came and they helped us learn how to meditate. And, um, you know, I, I had this executive coach years ago and she would say when I was working at Madison Square Garden, she would say, you need to meditate. And I said, I think you've lost your mind. And uh, she said, no, you need to find yours. You know, and I said, uh, you know, and so I, I tried it a bit when I was younger. And it, it wasn't until I got older that I, I truly understood the value of stillness and meditation. And so anyway, so we're all, you know, it's all this like incredibly hard charging people. We're all laying on the ground. We all have our eyes closed and they're walking us through this exercise and they've got this little like, I don't know, bowl and they're just making this sound going around and around and then bringing us through some breathing. And it was funny. Like I, I say this in a book, like I actually looked up and looked, you know, like I was like, you know, it was amazing. You know, you have 110 of these folks laying on the ground going through their breathing exercise. And I was just like, this is pretty, it's a, it was a special moment, um, special moment for the organization, special moment for me. And for a lot of people introduced them to meditation and mindfulness. Um, for, for me, again, I was introduced at a really, really uh, an age where I was working in, in Manhattan as president of Madison Square Garden with more pressure than you can possibly imagine. And not even half as much as I was putting on myself. And I kept saying like, she, and my, my coach, her name is Trisha Nadoff, incredible coach. She kept saying, Scott. And she had this like bohemian, like wonderful style. But she would say, Scott, you are a warrior. We need to move you to the sage phase. I'm like, but I don't want to be a sage. <laughs> She's like, right. To be a leader, to like realize your potential, it'll be lived and driven through others and their success. And so when you move on and you grow up, essentially, and you mature, that's when you can help others realize their dreams. And that's where you can take your talents and powers and get exponential return, uh, which I, did, I didn't even understand what she was saying. You know, can you think about like where, where my mind was at the time? And I was like, she's like, you just want the deal. I'm like, that's right. I want the deal. She was like, oh, I'm pulling your hair out. You know, that's when she said, you need to meditate. I'm like, I'm not meditating. You know, so anyway, she, she broke me down over a while, over after, after years. And I, and I came around, I, I've come to, to truly appreciate the gift of stillness. In fact, you know, in the, in the last two years or so, my, my formula for mental health is do something for your mind, something for your body, and something for your soul every day. Get the right amount of sleep, practice gratitude, and, and be where your feet are, which is phone down, head up. But back to the, to the soul part, um, I often talk about religion you know, and that's a very, or, or spirituality or meditation. I kind of wrap those into soul because you know what, like it's not for everybody, like reading scripture, saying prayers, going to church, that whole thing that I do is not for everybody. It's just not, you know, and, and that's okay. You know, and meditation is not for everybody and that's okay. Yoga is not for everybody and that's okay. Sitting out and listening to the birds chirp in the morning for 10 minutes is not for everybody but you have to do something. It's almost like pick one, you know? Um, and, um, and so I, I, when I talk to groups about the impact of meditation and mindfulness, and it's a way of life. It's not a 10 minute exercise. It's so different. You know, and that's why I go, I give you my six steps because, you know, you have to take care of your body. You do, you have to be learning, like learn one thing outside your core job a day. One thing, listen to a Ted talk, listen to, to this incredible podcast that brilliant has. You know, go uh, read an article, read a book, learn something, you know, um, find some stillness and sleep is, is like, that's a superpower. I, I, I'm not, I don't have that superpower and you know, I have trouble sleeping, but you know, at, we brought in, we brought in several experts from around the world to talk to us about sleep. And, you know, when I was growing up, it was sleep is for the week. That's what I heard a thousand times, you know, money never sleeps all this crap. And, and the reality is, is like, your body has to heal. Your mind has to heal. Your soul has to heal. And the way it heals is your sleep. Yep. And so you need six and a half to eight and a half hours, depending on your DNA and your makeup every day. Yep. 
And then, and gratitude is the simplest thing. When I speak to corporate groups, I speak to quite a few corporate groups and I would say, um, really simply, um, you know, pull out your phone and send a note to your mom. And, you know, we all have complicated relationships with our moms, you know, it's, and, and they're the most underappreciated people in the history of humankind. And, um, and it's really simple. It's like, mom, and I, I walk them through this exercise, mom, I love you. I really appreciate you. You know, although sometimes I don't say it, or sh- you know, just know that you're always in my heart. I really love you, Scott, or whatever your name is. And, um, and then I say, hey, in the, in the chat, just post what the responses are. And, you know, my mom's first note back was, Hunter, are you okay? Wow. Think about that. Think how crazy that is. That's my mom. And, and then I challenge everybody to do a 30 day, I'm challenging your listeners right now, like do a 30 day gratitude exercise. It takes you 60 seconds a day. Get up, brush your teeth, pick up your phone. Cause I know you already have it in your hand. And I just want you to send one text to somebody you appreciate in your life for 30 days. And, and you, you'll be, you'll be amazed. Like I, I have this, this notion again, I go back to some of the, like the, that version of the soul or spirituality is like, you know, the higher power will put some names in your head, whether you're in a shower or thinking during the day. And like you, you will, you will have an opportunity to touch somebody and they will send you a note over that 30 days. And they'll be like, wow, I needed this. I, I needed to hear this today. By the way, I was in a really bad place and you fished me out at the right time. I just want to say thank you. And you're like, whoa, that took me 60 seconds. Is, is this something I should be spending time with? And then you're, you're be where your feet are, you know, phone down, head up. It's like, you know, that epidemic I talked about in this country, it's like we need to self-regulate and we're, we're having a hard time. Um, I went to dinner the other night with some, some friends of mine. I walk up. I, I would like to say I was early, but I was late. Four of them sitting at a table. We hadn't seen each other in a year all on their phones. I was like, yo, what are we doing here, boys? What are we doing? You know, it's like, can we leave our phones in the car when we go to dinner? Like, is it that complicated? You know, we don't allow phones in the kitchen. We don't allow them in the bedrooms. And and my daughters think it's the most, I'm like an archaic dictator and, and maybe I am, but you know what? I don't think they can self-regulate. Yeah. And, and I, I think we have to do a better job. And, and as a victim of like some pretty nasty social media stuff directed at me that actually stung me, which surprised me so much. I'm like, am I letting this get to me? Like, how is my 14 year old going to handle that? Like, how is she equipped to handle something on social media? She's not, that's the answer. No, I, I think you're right. And that is one thing I worry about. And I think we're seeing that in rates of suicide and depression, right? That it's just, um, there are some things that are very unhealthy, but what you're talking about, about choosing, you know, to use this technology in certain ways at certain times is, is powerful. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. And for that 30 day challenge, I'm going to take that on personally. Let's go. All yeah, right. That's great. And, uh, and I, I did hear you say it's an invitation to listeners, but I just want to emphasize that, that an invitation, whenever you happen to be hearing this, we're recording this in September of 2021. But from the moment you hear this, I invite you to, to take the challenge that Scott just issued. Take 60 seconds a day, one text message, or maybe you want to clarify or add to that, Scott. Challenge is this is like when you get up in the morning, send a note of gratitude to someone in your life every day for 30 days. And it will change your being because you will be thinking the entire day subconsciously about who I'm going to, who am I going to be grateful for? And brilliant. I'd be interested in if you feel this too, when you express gratitude, often the, the biggest beneficiary is actually you. Have you experienced that before? I, ha- I have, I have. And at the same time, I, it, as I've practiced and studied gratitude, and I don't know if you've experienced this, I've found sometimes it, paradoxically has the inverse effect of what I mean is like, there are times where intellectually, I think I know I should be grateful. Like right. I'm very blessed. I should be grateful. Other people have much less, but then I don't feel it emotionally. And then I intellectually, I get some kind of guilt. Like I should feel a certain way. So paradoxically, the attempt to feel gratitude kind of backfires sometimes. That's interesting. I, I will tell you my, my, uh, my youngest daughter is, is like that. Like we're all, like we're all just wired differently. I mean, that's just the facts, right? There's some universal truths in the world. Um, and what she does, and I, I, you know, I, I've never, like, I've never said, I, I do get accused in the house of trying to teach lessons all the time. <laughs> I, I get the dad, everything is not a life lesson. Now it's like, well, but anyway, um, but, but one, two things she does, in, um, which might be interesting, um, she, I, as I mentioned, she's 14. and she ever listens to this, she's not going to be happy that I'm sharing this. So her name's Eliza. 
don't hold me accountable. Lies, I love you if you're listening. Um, but she does, she writes down 14 things a day she's grateful for and has never repeated. And this is going on three and a half years. Think about that. So she's 14. So started when she was 11 years old. And she will, I mean, and it could be, when, it, when she started, it was about, hey, mom, dad, my brother, my sister, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins. And now it's like, you know, a leaf falling off a tree. Um, hey, a teacher mentioned something to me at school. Um, the most beautiful sunset. Like, it's pretty cool. Like, and so again, it's, she, she is programming herself because she does not, that is not intuitive to her. And that's what I love most about it. The other thing she does, which is maybe the cutest thing in the history of mankind, is she has a happy thoughts clicker. So at night, if you go by her room, you'll hear click, 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 click again, because she's not wired that way. I think it's her subconscious way of helping her find happiness and find positive energy and finding gratitude. It's kind of cool. Yeah, that's awesome. And I love too what you're saying about phone down, head up. I love just the, the brevity of phrasing it that way and so forth. But you tell, you tell a lot of stories in your book, which I'm... I, I really appreciate But you tell one story about being in a restaurant and a couple observing. So will you talk about what that is and the, and the note that they passed? And, and sure. The sure. So it's a good, a good friend of mine, Don, he, um, he was at breakfast with his son and um, there was an older couple, like one table over staring him down a bit. And um, you know, it was just like one of those few one-on-one -on -one moments you get as a dad. And something happened at a game the, the night before in a college basketball game. So he, he went to go check the press conference. So he's watching this video while his son is probably doing the same. And, and he was getting a stank eye pretty good from the, from this grandma in, in the, in the diner. And so she got up left and then came back and just dropped a note on, on his lap. And it says something like, uh, you have, you know, time is the most precious commodity and you're wasting it. Looking at your phone, you should be paying attention to your son. And, um, and, and his reaction, his first reaction, like it'd be mine. is like, she thinks she is. I'm a great dad. Like, that's the first reaction he had. Yeah. And then he gets in the car and he's like, you know what? Like, I need to be better. I need to do better. I, I think about this all the time at home. Like in the morning, it's like NCAA tournament survive in advance. Like it's chaos in our house in the morning. Like there are no meaningful moments in the morning. Then they're at school and they got cheerleading and basketball, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. Homework. You know, I'm at work. I come home. Like, how much time do I really have? Like real time, like real meaningful time. People keep talking. I need better, better balance. It's not about balance. It's about, can we create, can we be where our feet are? Can we create meaningful moments? Can we create meaningful conversation? And that that's life to me. Like that is how we make an impact and a difference. So I think that was Don's big lesson. Yeah. That, that, that was a powerful one. And my kids are about that age right now. So it particularly resonated with me. You know, you just touched on balance. This is something I want to ask you about as well, because my experience, you know, having a dad who was very driven, who, in my view, paid for his success with his life. You know, he died at 64 years old, didn't yeah. sleep like you, you know, talked about, including a lot of other things, didn't get the kind of exercise or pay attention to his diet and things like this. I think it'd be easy to accuse him of not having lived a balanced life, but he's certainly not alone in that. Many people who achieve extraordinary success you know, put something else on the back burner or just omit it entirely. But you have a perspective in your book about balance that I really love. And it sounds like a good friend gave you a view of it and likened balance to a teeter totter. Will you talk about how you think about balance and when people ask you how you, if you've achieved it or how you maintain it, like what, how you respond? Yeah. It's, it's the first question I get just about every time I talk to groups, particularly young groups, which always surprises me because when I was young, I, didn't, I mean, I didn't have any money. I did, all I had was work. Like, I didn't have anything other than work. That's what I did. And so particularly this young next generation, they're really interested in balance. And I, I say the same thing to them. Every group is like, I'm not interested in balance. I don't, I don't, it's not something I aspire to. I don't think it's reasonable. And, and Laura O'Connor is my friend. Um, and she says balance is like teeter tires. There's nothing fun or good happening when, when it's flat. She's like, all the action happens when it's moving. And, and I would just pile onto that and say, just think about being where your feet are. Think about being present. When I'm at home, I need to be at home and be a dad and be a husband. That's what I need to do, okay? And when I'm at work, I need to be the best executive I can be. And when I'm at church, I need to be the best church member. When I'm in the community, serving the community, I need the best community member. 
if I am somewhere else or half somewhere, I just can't be as effective. Um, and it's hard. I, I, this, this notion of like getting home at five o'clock, like it doesn't, I mean, I'm sure it exists for some people. It doesn't exist for me for sure. Like I, I can't even, fa- you know, I can't even fathom it. Um, that was the gift of COVID. I actually made family dinners for the first time in 20 years. By the way, they're wonderful. Um, and, but even as family dinners, like we sit down the first couple of times and I'm looking around and I, I'm really, I'm a conversationalist. I'm, I'm interested in people. I'm interested in things. And I ended up buying, this is a really embarrassing story, but I ended up buying conversation starter cards. I think about that. Like, think about that, you know? So it's early COVID. I buy this like stack of cards and then I just start going through them. And that became a way that we could have conversations more than that. The transactional ones that don't matter, which yeah. is like, what are you doing later? Who have you called? How was school? How was the zoom? Blah, 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 blah. You can still have those. It's okay. But how are we getting into meaningful conversations and, and, and spending the time we had the limited time we have you say you have kids around that age. Like, what do you have an hour, two hours a day? Like, honestly, like how much time do you actually have where you have their attention and you're with them? It's not enough. Yeah, it's, it's so really. I'd rather spend time that way. Yeah, that that's, and I think about it. It's it's probably not even that. And if it is that, they're all together, so it's not as though it's one on one. You know, that that's right. Kind of but um, there's something in oh, and 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 I've learned the power of questions, right? As a coach, the power of a single question to change someone's trajectory of their whole life in some cases. And in your book, you you include some very powerful questions. And it, there's one that touches on what we're talking about now, right? And it's this about WMI. Will you talk about where did you learn that? What is it and what can it do for somebody? Yeah, so WMI is, is what's most important. Um, and I, I, uh, I will say that I would love to say, to hold myself of the champion and example of all things great when it comes to WMI. But um, the first time I did an audit, well, anyway, so <clears throat> the, the general thinking in the space is that High performers spend 65% of their time on what's most important at work. So, so you just write down the three things that you think are most important. And with, with, with real ambitious folks that I've, I've dealt with over the time as they're kind of climbing a ladder, they, how can it only be three? I'm like, it's maybe five, but there are only three things that matter in, in you being world-class at your job. You know, you, you can stretch them out or you can do whatever you want. You can make it 15. It's just once it gets to a number, you won't, there is no, You've, you've just wasted your time. There are three things typically um, that are most important in terms of being world-class in your, in your, in your work. I've just expanded that a bit and I've added relationships and, and self to that because I talked about my formula, do something for your mind, something for your body, something for your soul, you know, get your sleep, practice gratitude, be where your feet are. And like, where does that show up? You know, in my three things that are most important at work, like, it doesn't show up. So I, I think you have to do that for personal and for relationships and the relationship one it's like really straightforward for a lot of us, but, but young people, it's not so straightforward. They're like, well, what do you mean? I have a lot of friends. I'm like, okay, are there, are there any that are most important to you? How about your mom and your dad? You know, how about your brother or sister? I, I don't know. It's like, how about your roommate who, you know, put down three people where, you know, you have to spend time nurturing relationships. Um, and then the, the magic is you go audit your calendar and you want to be horrified go out of your calendar after going through this exercise. And, um, and I, I came in at a whopping 23%, by the way, just, just so you can, you know, go team it. And, and I had to ask myself a question. Like I either have to change my, what's most important or change my process. Like you, you can't say it's most important if you're going to spend a fifth of your time on it. Yeah. And, um, and so, so I learned a magic word. No, I, I, I had a really hard time saying no to anybody for anything. Um, I love to serve others. I love to help people. Um, I love to, to do the little things. And at the end of the day, like you get to a point in life and say, okay, I've got a limited amount of time. I want to be where my feet are in my life. Where am I going to spend it? And so, you know, and for me, it was like little, little things would take up a lot of time. It's like my friends would call and say, Hey, Hey, my kid's graduating. Can you just, you might hop on the phone and just doing a informational interview. And I'd be like, I, I don't do those anymore. He's got 15 minutes. Like can you just talk to him. Now you're gonna connect them with somebody. Think about that. It's like my best friends. Mm-hmm. But like, if I don't do that there, it's just gonna, it, it's, that is a symptom, you know? And so that would steamroll. And if you're listening to this and be like, that dude is a jerk. Yes, I had to find some way to say no to things 
that I would normally just do, yeah. you know? And, um, and so, yeah, so some of that got a little complicated and messy, but at the end of the day, I started just become more effective at home with my relationships and at work because I was spending more time on the things that really matter. Yeah. Well, there's something so powerful about awareness and choice, right? And what we might think of as boundaries, or like you said, learning a magic word, no, that, you know, we want people to like us and we want to, we do want to help people and things like that. But if we're really honest, if that compromises what's truly most important to us, then it's really not in our own interest. So it can be uncomfortable, but there's a way that um, I actually take that and I'm inspired by it. I'm challenged by it. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> no, that, that's right. It. I just, the, the word for me of the summer has been intentional. Like I want to be intentional at everything I do. I want to be intentional about the moments um, that matter. I want to be intentional about where I spend my time. I want to be intentional about things that come out of my mouth. Like I actually want to be less flippant, um, less robotic, less, Hey, this is what I'm supposed to do and saying, you know, what should I be doing and why? And, and, um, and that's been serving me very well. What, um, what did you learn? I know that you could probably, we could focus the whole interview on that one question, but what did you learn or what surprised you in the process of writing? Be where your feet are. Oh man, I mean, I have so many. That's the best open-ended question I've ever gotten. So I, I'll, I will say, um, humility. Um, to raise my hand and ask for help. I, I, I tell you a quick. I, I should be answer questions with a story, which I know will drive some people crazy. But um, I was in Mozambique. It's great this for summer. podcast, by the way. Okay, good, 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 good. So I was in Mozambique this summer, and um. Uh, with my 17 year old and we were with this group called Heffy um, and they send 4,000 kids around the world, do service projects in, in cool parts of the world that need help. And we, so we were building, helping build a school. And um, I was in the uh, um, cement mix. I have no skill, by the way. I'm, I'm like unskilled labor at its best. And uh, my daughter Kira is up there like plastering and doing like the stuff where you need skill. And they put me in like the cement mixing and then, you know, wheelbarrowing cement. So anyway, so I'm wheelbarrowing the cement and, and, um, and I, I, I go down a steep, the steep path. Um, and then I have to make a left and then go just up on the sidewalk, roll it down to the classroom. Somebody would help me lift it up, roll it to the classroom. Done. You know, okay. That's the, that's what I have to do for nine hours. So first time I go down there, I'm like, this can't be that hard. And I'm like pretty strong guy. I'm bigger. You know, like I did it when I was 14 and could barely like, you know, I was like holding on for dear life and would, would chip it. But now I'm like, I got this. So I started going down until about half time down this hill. I'm thinking like, I'm not making that turn. I'm just, it's not happening. You know? And so, uh, and all I'm thinking about in my head, which is strange, is resources are so precious there. Um, you know, it's like the area we were in was like 97% unemployment. It's the third poorest country in the world. And it's, I didn't want to spill, I didn't want to spill any of this because I didn't want to be disrespectful because I know how important it is. And so, uh, so I'm starting to like, you know, a bead of sweat is dripping down and I can see this thing all happening in slow motion. I'm like, oh no. So sure enough, like I don't make the turn and I go off into the sand. And I'm like kind of nudging it with like the top of my thigh, like an inch every 10 seconds in this deep, deep sand. And uh, my daughter, Kira, and her friend, Sophie, um, Sophia, come up and they just lift it up and put me back on the path and, and I'm on my way. And I, no problems. And, um, and I always think about that, you know, over the night, I got nine hours in the sun, you think about a lot of stuff. And I was like, man, is that so analogous to life? Is that so analogous to writing a book? Is that so analogous to, to kids today? And, um, because like that path is hard, like the path we should be on the one that where we're like the best version of ourselves. We're like good dads, we're responsible, responsive husbands. We're doing the right things to make the world better. We're working hard, we're just all that stuff on that path. Hard. I'm not carrying a 150 pound thing of cement. It's hard. And then I go off, go off that path. It's harder. And what I didn't do when I went off that path, I didn't raise my hand. I didn't ask for help, which is so crazy. And then, you know, my friend's like, hey, was that really humbling when the, when the, the two teenage girls lifted that thing up with like, it was no problem to put on it. I was like, actually, no. I was, I was like, the only thing I was mad about was I didn't ask him to come get it. I should have been like, hey, Keith, can you come over and grab this? And so, but anyway, I go on my way. That, that was like writing a book for me. Like the, the path was really hard. And when I stumbled, um, I wasn't, you know, as quick as I'd like to be to, to ask for help. But I, I will say 
boy, man, that, that industry is, um, after I say this, I'm probably never going to get another book ever in the history of my life, but that industry kind of seeded its business to Amazon and Barnes and Noble to some extent. And I think, you know, the world, I say this a lot in my, my business is the world is about data and content. Like that's the world right now. Okay. And they have the content, but they don't have the data. So it's very hard for them. Can you imagine like the, the content that these publishers have? And I was really fortunate with St. Martin's Press and Tim Bartlett, amazing guy. But they don't have the, they don't have data. So you're you're now relying on on others to, to go sell your book. And that's that's a hard that 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 industry, um, that's a tough industry to be in, that's for sure. So I learned I keep going on this one. I, I literally, the humility part, I'll just tell you the story. Um, so I, you know, my, my best friend took his own life, unfortunately. And uh, that's the genesis for me starting to write. So that was my healing part. Um, and I would write to heal. This is like, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Forrest Gump when Forrest is like running, like run Forrest, run. That was me just right. I just wrote I'm like on my little iPad. And I just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. And, and it was probably like 50% gibberish. And, um, but, but some, the stuff that was intelligible was stuff about overcoming adversity. And, you know, um, sometimes when I really struggled and someone lent me a hand and helped me or gave me an insight and I, I was able to tackle it. And, and so, you know, I never had the intention of writing a book and I never had the intention of, of publishing a book. Um, and then here I have, you know, 300 pages written and my wife was a little concerned about me. I burst into tears when somebody says to me at work and walking in my office. Like it was, I was just out of sorts. My wife um, called her friend Randall right up and he's like, Hey, let's see what you have here, Scott. You know, you, my wife says you're writing a lot. I was like, yeah, it's just an escape. It's just not, you know, it's just my own. It's kind of like a journalish type thing. And, and he pressed me. He's like, well, you know, you say you want to make a difference in the world. You say you want to impact people. Like what if like a CEO actually showed a vulnerable side? Like what, what, what if, like, you know, it, you know, what if you didn't do like a, you know, I don't know, pat yourself on the back, you know, like, you know, that Lego guy, everything is awesome. Like, what if there wasn't a, everything is awesome book? And I was like, well, that's the only thing I'd ever put out. And he said, well, what if you could impact one person? And I was like, well, then I would do it. He's like, you should do it. This will impact one person. And so then I started down the road and the road is long and painful <laughs> and humbling. Like I, I, you know, I sit in a, I mean, I'm for your listeners. Like I know that I'm for, like, I know how blessed I am. I know how fortunate I am. I know the access I have. Most people don't have. So I, I don't mean to make light of it, but I mean, my best friends are running two of the biggest talent agencies in the world, you know? So like I called them and I was like, Hey, can I, do you have any agents that will represent me? Okay. So this is like, I was in his wedding best friend. Okay. So I, I'd go see this agent who my friends, like his boss's 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 boss. Okay. And he knows it's me. He knows the connection. And we sit down for lunch. And he's like, yeah, there's no chance. <laughs> you know, right? Like, and I was like, wait, what? He's like, yeah, this is not it's in a book. I mean, you'll never sell this. Like, this is no, this is nothing. And I was like, wow. Oh, okay. Well, thanks for lunch. I got, you know, that was quick. So I go see my other friend who, um, who, manages another agency and he's like scott i said look will you come with me to the meeting like because I, I just want to he's like look i have two of the top book agents in the world that work with me like they're, they're wonderful like, good friends and so sure enough they're reading through the book they got it all like dog-eared and you know those little post-it notes out there i'm like great they did the work and it's a, an older man and a, a younger woman i mean i guess everyone's young to me but she's a younger woman she's she says can i go first i was like yeah definitely she's like talks for like you know you know the um in the peanuts was like wah 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 at some point it became wah 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 right i was like holy crap i was like hey uh just hold on for one second let me let me see if i just i just want to just make sure i heard you. you 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 said i can't write um this isn't a book nobody would buy it and even if someone was dumb enough to publish it nobody would read it is that what you just said she's like pretty much i was like so I turned to the older guy and I say, um, um, hey, uh, you know, do you feel the same way? And she's, he's like, I mean, 
everything except for the part about uh, selling it because I can sell anything. <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh my I was like, oh, man! I was like, so this is that bad? That I, I'm in that category. Like, hey, I'll sell it, but like, no, no promises. So, um, so I walked out. And I said, and he said, I'll represent you. I don't know, whatever. And I was like, no, thank you. Like, I, I really want someone to believe in in me and and quite frankly, mindfulness and a vision for for vulnerability and authenticity and, and, and things that I think this world needs. Like we need a voice. Um, and, and so then I called my sister-in-law, ex-sister-in-law, Stacey O'Neill. And, um, she's a big time Hollywood producer, agent, you know, blah, blah, blah. And man, just like Van Diesel and Amy Adams and Johnny Knox, all these incredible people. And she's like, look, I'm going to put you in touch with one of my partners. He knows the best book agents. Like, you know, just sit with me. We'll figure this out. And I was like, maybe I shouldn't do it because you, 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 you get that, like, I don't know. It's like the ultimate, I guess the ultimate expression of ego is writing a book. Like, I have something to say that I can help you. That's like, you know, and I don't see myself like that. Like, I don't want to be that guy. I want to, I want to help others, but I, I you know, so I was starting to just recalibrate my thoughts. And I was just like, maybe this is not meant to be. Like, this is a cool thing that I can just give to my kids and they'll know my stories and, and um, she's like, no, 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 it's ridiculous. And so she sets me up with Jan Miller, this incredible agent who actually discovered Stephen Covey. She's like, she's published 2000 books. She's like, Jan will love you. Okay. She's like, I don't know if this is a book or not, but she's going to love you. And so uh, fortunately um, her partner and she got on the phone with me and then I went to go see Jan. Um, and she's like, this right here, this is a book, this, it needs work. And I was like, great. I'm open to it. She's like, are you open to bringing in a writer to help you? I was like, yeah, I, I just, I look, I just literally want to help make a dent. I mean, that's what I want to do. I want to move somebody. And she's like, oh, you'll move more than one person. I was like, well, if we move one, I got it. She's like, oh, this will move. So anyway, so she introduced me to a bunch of writers. And what's interesting, brilliant, is like, she gave me two sports writers and one kind of general writer. And I was like, Jan, this isn't a sports book. She's like, I know, I know. But like, I need to sell it. And this is how I'll package it. I was like, I just, I do not want to be packaged as a sports guy. I don't She's like, but that's what you are. I'm like, but that's not what this book is. She's like, well, that's a little complicated. I'm like, well, you know, Jay Shetty wrote a book. I mean, who's he? He's a monk, you know, like it's, by the way, that book is brilliant. No pun intended, but like, it's like, why, why not? And she's like, well, you know, everybody gets packaged a certain way. And, and so anyway, she, she was wonderful. She coached me through it. And then I ended up um, working with Michelle Bender, who's, if anyone out there is writing a book and you need a writer, it's expensive. But Michelle had this great process. She spent like, man, I don't know, five hours with me on the phone where, she, you know, I'm just talking to her. We're, we're FaceTiming, but I was just like, she's like asking me questions. She's like, tell me the story of so I said, Michelle, I, I sent you all the stuff I have. You can just read it. She goes, no, I want you to tell me the story. And so I'd be like, okay, I'll tell her the story. And so by the sixth call, I was halfway through. She's like, okay, I got it. I was like, what do you have? She, I have your voice. I was like, you have my what? You, you have my, she's like, yeah, well now I can write that. So it will sound like you. And it was really cool. Like, because, you know, I have my, like, you know, these 300 pages and she's got to like narrow it down and, and, um, and knock out a bunch of stories and then tighten up the ones and then, you know, kind of lace it into a book. And it was really amazing to see the process of what a real professional does um, versus like an amateur writer. Um, and then she would, you know, we would collaborate. I mean, she's, a, she's a, si a cool single mom in New York. And so she'd be sending me stuff at like 2 AM, you know, Hey, I just finished chapter three. I want you to read it. I want hard edits. I was like, so I texted her back, like, what's a hard edit. She goes, read this. Like you're trying to like get exactly where you want to go. Like whatever you don't like here, if you don't like the way a word sounds stretched out, if you don't like a sentence, if you don't like the tone, if you don't like the title, she said, this is your book. I'm here to enable you to get your message out. My job is to enable, and I was like, wow, this is awesome. So it was a really cool process. It went pretty fast at that point. Wow. Um, and then it sold, it sold yeah. pretty quickly. Yeah, what, what a gift to have somebody who is willing to invest the time and energy and has the talent to kind of internalize, you know, what you've written to the point that they get your Isn't, voice and then serve you by helping you bring that to the world. That's pretty and cool. Then, and then when you do the audio book, like you... I mean, you're in like, I mean, normally you go into a studio, but because it was COVID, no studio. So I like, they, some sound guy came and he set up like a fake studio in my office in Newark. 
and with like the soundproofing all around me. And then, you know, and meanwhile, their car is going by. He's like, wait, wait, stop. You know, like we're stopping every five minutes because a car would go by because that's how sensitive the sound was. And as I'm reading it, it's the first time, and I haven't listened to it because it's really hard to listen to your own voice. But as I was listening to it, it was truly like my, my voice and my cadence. And my, it was really, really kind of cool to see. So it was, that part was something like getting an agent was like a kick in the teeth every two seconds. And then having the agent and being like finding, being comfortable enough to say like, Hey, like, this is me, like with the wheelbarrow, okay? I'm in the sand. And I was like, I need help. But I didn't even know what to ask for. And she did. That's why Jan Miller is Jan Miller. I mean, she said like, Hey, here's, here are three writers. One of these is going to be perfect for you. You need to talk to them all. I did. And I felt, you know, found the right person, but, it, and, and then the promotion, you know, there's no book tours anymore. So I'm just doing, you know, virtual. And, and there's something about like, and it was cool. Like I had like a GMA three, good morning America three, which was cool. And I had a CBS this morning. Like that was like pretty cool, you know, things to be on. I've, I've done several podcasts, which have gone well. Um, but I think there is something to being in person where you can actually like find that, find that mix. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so it's been, it's been a, like, I don't know. Like, I, I don't, I didn't have any expectation. I don't know. It's hard to say. Like I've gotten, you know, my mom loved it by the way, for whatever it's worth. She thinks I'm a genius, but, but I've, I've gotten notes from, from strangers to my LinkedIn and they have said, I just listened to your audio book. It's changed my life. I'm going to be a better father. I'm going to be a better husband. I'm going to be better. You're like that when you get a note and I've gotten, I don't know, a hundred of them. It's humbling. Like, it's like, you know, all the crap, all the hours, all the drive, all the push, all the work. You're like, okay. Cause I said, I just wanted to hit one. I've hit more than one. Um, and that, that part was, is pretty cool. And see, Oh, by the way, it's just seeing, I don't mean to keep talking, but see when you walk into a bookstore. Okay. And you see your book on a shelf. That's about the coolest thing in the world. Like that, that imagine, imagine it's like, um, what was that movie with Ricky Valens where he hears his radio, like he hears the record on the radio, whatever. And like, or Jimmy Valens, like you hear that. Like, I was like, it was like that. I imagine that was the kind of feeling. And in one, I went in and, and I was with my brother-in-law and he's just like, he hands me a marker. He's like, sign the book. I'm like, I'm not just going to sign a book. And so he's like, I know. Are you serious? Like, that would be cool. Like you go to buy a book and your signature's in there. I'm like, all right. So I was in there just signing a book. which was kind of funny. So, I've run into an in airports and, and uh, have, have popped into a couple of stores, bars and doubles and seen them. And it's like, it's cool. It's, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty humbling to say the least. That is cool. I mean, the things between getting notes from readers that you didn't even know telling you yeah. about the impact it's had on their life, seeing your book in a bookstore, um, getting royalty checks is pretty cool. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty good. So, so these, even when they're not the biggest, right. It, but these are the things that I think um, people who feel called to write first, they just have, like, I think you did, they had something inside them that wanted to be expressed. Yeah. And then the path to get there and how big it is or how many people it reaches. I mean, all those are things that I think that can actually keep us from saying what it is we have to say, but your story, I love this idea that, you know, you didn't start with this grand ambition to be a best-selling author or something. You just, wanted to share, you wanted to make a difference and, and you have, and it might be, might be too early to say, and I know a lot of people only ever write one book, but, um, do you think you'll do it again? I don't know. I mean, it's, I mean, my wife and I got asked the other day to, to write something together. I thought that would be kind of cool. Just doing something with her. It's totally different genre. It's like a more of a faith-based book. And I was like, that could be kind of cool. I, I don't, it's a lot. It is a lot. It's consuming. It takes years too. It's not like, you know, you see like these guys like James Patterson who are, who are punching out like six books a year. I'm like, who is this guy? Like, how do you, I can't even, I mean, he must have a team of people that he's collaborating with. And because I can't even imagine um, how incredible that is. Like it, it was, it was a lot. I, I don't, I don't think that's what I'm meant to be or do. Like, I, I, I think this is a, it's a great moment in time and, and I hope the book lives and, and sells. There, there was the other day, um, I think it was um, one of the Mets, so Yankees or Mets. Anyway, a bunch of people sent me this quote is that one of the guys says like, 
look, I'm just trying to be where my feet are. And I, you know, a bunch of them sent me, was like, he read your book. It's just kind of funny, you know? That's awesome. Um, so, so there's stuff like that that happens that you just think like, hey, maybe, 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 you know, maybe people would just start to try to be more present and put their phone down and engage with their kids or just like be on the subway, just, you know, kind of get your head up and look around or, or walk into a meeting. You know, we have these like no phone zones at, at work and or I did. And um, we come in and check your phone on the, on the table. And I, I will tell you, the young people look at me like, Hey buddy, just cause you used to like etch your, your notes into stone. Doesn't mean we all have to. And that's like, grab a pen. you can do it. You know, I'm all sarcastic. But, but it's not about like the notes. It's about the before and the after. And that's what we're missing. Like we're missing the, hey, Billy, how was your weekend? Hey, hey, uh, oh, your kid had a soccer game? How'd it go? Oh, hey, you rolled down to Lake Powell. Was that an incredible trip? Like that's what we're missing. And, and, and the work stuff too. Like, hey, I know you're working on a project. Can I help you with something? We're missing it all. And like the, the, what, what used to be that, that work family is just becoming too transactional. And, and the, the transition to this like, um, now hybrid work environment is just going to make it harder. And so that's why you want to talk about like, you know, my, my, like you could call it crazy genius or just insanity. One of them, I'm sure I'm, I'm walking on that line at times is like, I FaceTime everybody. My wife laughs at it cause I do it personally too. And she's like, you can't FaceTime people. They don't want to see you. I'm like, they don't want to see me, but I want to see that they're paying attention. Like I do. And I want to know, like, are you with me? Or are you not? Cause if you're not, don't waste my time. Don't waste your time. Just move on. Just say, hey, Scott, I got to bounce. All good. And she's like, yeah, but do you have to FaceTime them? I'm like, <laughs> I do. You know? And now Zoom has obviously become like uh, part of who we are and part of our society. It's become a verb. And um, and I, I think to the extent, I know people have Zoom fatigue, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, no, I totally get you. But this is the way that that we, if we're not going to be together, we, we need to be looking each other in the eyes and, and, and talking and communicating because you know, the voice is what, I don't know, 20% of communication. Think about that, right? So there's so much nonverbal stuff that's going on. I just want to make sure we're all connected. And I think that's part of being, being present. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I want to go ahead and transition us to the enlightening lightning round. Let's do it. How are you doing? I'm loving it. Good. Okay. You make it so easy. I mean, you have a gift. I mean, it's, it's, it's no surprise you're, you're so successful at this. Thank you. I sure enjoy it. It's one of my, it's one of my favorite things to do. So, okay. Question number one, please complete the following sentence. Why, um, with something other than, by the way, speaking of Forrest Gump with something other than a box of chocolates. So, okay. Life is like a roller coaster. All right. Question number two here. I'm borrowing Peter Thiel's question. What important truth do very few people agree with you on? Reading your scriptures and getting on your knees and saying prayers every day will bring you some peace that you're not accustomed to. Okay. Question number three. If you were required every day for the rest of your life to wear a t-shirt with a slogan on it or a phrase or a saying or a quote or a quip, what would the shirt say? I'm okay. You're okay. All right. Question number four. What book other than your own have you gifted or recommended most often? There are two. Um, Think Like a Monk by Jay Shetty. And Leadership and Self-Deception by the Arbinger Group. Why those books? Think Like a Monk is, it's so connected to be where your feet are. It's just, he's a better writer and a better storyteller and smarter. Um, it's a, a, a modern day, <clears throat> he's like a mindfulness version of Tony Robbins. He's a, he is a transformational person in society. And his message is very much needed right now. It's called Think Like a Monk, read the book or listen to it. Um, and Leadership and Self-Deception is something I've had my, my staffs read for my last three companies before they can start work and they have to write me a note. And because it's about treating people like people and not treating them like objects. And to me, that's like a, a core principle as to how you create a wonderful place to work. What, um, what are you currently reading? Wherever you go, there you are. This is next on my list. Oh, yes. Very much into your space right now. I'm very much into um, mindfulness and being present and finding an inner peace and like packaging it in a way that people can understand. 
Um, it, we have to get away from like the, the seventies version of it. Cause it, it exists in the seventies with the, kind of the hippie movement. It's like my fo- my folks were hippies. So it was like that movement was real. Um, and then the eighties was a little bit more like kill or be killed and let's go to wall street and let's make a lot of money. Greed is good and all that crap. And that bled into the nineties. And I think when we hit 2000, people started saying like, I want a little bit more about from life. Like, how do I, what, what are we, and I think what we're searching for is, is some version of, um, meaning and purpose. Um, uh, we need to find our why, like why we do what we do, why we exist. And, um, and then find some inner peace, you know, all, all in a way to, you know, I, I hate to like blend like, um, secular phrases with, with such, such beauty, but like, how do you optimize yourself? Like, that's how I think about it, you know, and, and the way to optimize is to, to be grounded and to, find your your center and to be mindful and 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 put that into the world in a way that people can use it and leverage it for good i i totally agree somebody i interviewed a while back he he gave this interest what i thought was a super interesting model and what you're saying reminds me of it he said you know for basically hundreds of thousands if not millions of years success on this planet for human beings was survival it was literally just survival. <laughs> and then it became yeah. material. Like you're saying, right. Wall Street and let's go make right. a money and buy the BMW and take right. a vacation. And then it became experiential where it was, okay, yeah. I've got the stuff and I'm not fulfilled, but maybe, maybe it's base jumping or maybe it's whatever. And then we realized even it wasn't necessarily experiences, but it's this whole thing that you're saying about peace and centeredness and connectedness and meaning. It's maybe more intangible, but when you look at Maslow's hierarchy and our lower level needs get met, but we're not fulfilled. And then we're asking, you know, how do I achieve self-actualization or optimization or even transcendence? And these right. things that I don't think we have a great way of talking about as a society, but we're all experiencing. And then as you've already pointed out in this interview, that the pandemic has just exacerbated this, this isolation yeah. and disconnection and things like that. Yeah. You said it, you said it a lot, a lot more elegantly than I did. Like I, I just, keep telling my, my young ambitious friends, like, just remember you get to the top of that mountain and it's like two things you're going to find up there. One, it is freaking lonely. I said, the second thing you're going to find, you're going to have to climb down the other side and start hiking up another one. Just remember, like, just know that that's what you're doing and it's okay. Like I've learned, like, I don't, I don't know. I've, I've, I've judged. I don't judge. I judge. I shouldn't say don't judge. I judge a lot less these days. You know, I root, I root a lot more. I pray a lot more. I, I, I try to help a lot more, but, but the older I get, the less I judge. I'm, I've made every mistake you could possibly make. I mean, I, I'm sure there are more and I'll, I'll continue to do it today and tomorrow. Um, but I, I just found that, you know, I don't know. There's, there seems to be life. Life is, is better uh, rooting for people and life is better helping others. And life is better for me, you know, and maybe that doesn't work for everybody, but, but for me finding that, that way to, to you, I guess, move on to that sage phase that my, you know, my coach talked about away from the warrior phase. I'm, I'm, I'm nowhere near the warrior I was. Um, but I, but I've definitely, you know, found, you know, kind of hap- my own happiness in helping others realize their dreams and finding that peace that I have and, and, um, and, and recognizing that we're imperfect souls too. Like that, that alone, just recognizing, like when you get older, you're like, it's kind of okay. It's like moving from middle school to high school, right? In middle school, it's a train wreck, you know, because kids, the boys can't communicate. Boys can't string two sentences together in middle school. Yeah. And the girls are worried about and concerned about everything and everybody other than like, hey, just being okay. And you get to high school, everyone's kind of like, meh, you know, I'm okay. You're okay. You know, hey, we'll do our thing. We kind of like break off into little groups and, you know, maybe in senior year we come together, but, you know, everything's fine. Everything's more fine. I find that way with like, adults in life too like it's like you know you get to a get to a certain point and and you you understand your flaws it's not like you're accepting um it's just that you know like we're vulnerable we're we're human we're we're fallible we're, we'll make mistakes but you just know like hey okay i have a little bit you know i want to aspire to be better i know what i need to do to live my best life and stay on that two by four i talked about and sometimes i'm going to end up in the sand and hopefully i'll raise my hand and get help and get back on and and I'm going to do the best I can to, to help others and leave the world better. That's a beautiful perspective. 
Awesome. All right. We're going to keep going through the enlightening lightning round. Here we go. Question number five relates to travel. So you have traveled a lot in your life. What's one thing you do when you travel or something you take with you to make your travel less painful or more enjoyable? I overpack. So I'm one of those overpackers. So I, I will never be short of clothes. That's what I do. All right. Question number six. What's one thing you've started or stopped doing in order to live or age well? I feel like we've probably talked about some of those. Peloton, exercise, got my body right. I, I um, you know, pe- the COVID started. Day two, I ordered a Peloton bike. I ride for 45 minutes a day. It's taken 15 pounds off my body, two inches off my waistline, and I sweat like it's, um, I'm in a, in a sauna. Um, so that, that's, that's definitely what I've started. That's awesome. You know, my I wife, eat a lot of chocolate chip cookies too, for whatever it's worth. <laughs> Probably not while you're on the Peloton. <laughs> no, just after. Uh, you earn it. My wife bought a Peloton and I haven't been on it. But you need to try it. Yeah. It's true. I'm telling you, it is. And I, I, don't, I don't listen to the, the, the coaches anymore. And they're wonderful. I'm sure they do a wonderful job. But I, I just watch a Netflix show because I know the output I want. I know the sweat I want. Um, but it is, you can't get, I don't know how you get a sweat like that anywhere else. Okay. You need to try it. Do you, do you wear this shoes? Do you buy this? Yeah, shoe? I do. Yeah. I do. I haven't wanted to do that. <laughs> yeah. but. but once you get used to like, you click them off. Um, I had a problem like the first three times I did it after that, I was fine. It's just a little like, it's almost like the opposite of, of Dorothy from the Wizard of Oz, where she just wants to go home and clicks her shoes, just click them the other way you'll pop right out of there. But it's, it's, it's a, it's a sweat. All right. Well, this, this podcast is, I'm committing to things here. The Let's go. Gratitude thing. And I'm going to buy the shoes. I'm going to try the Peloton. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Um, question number seven, what's one thing you wish every American knew? I wish they knew <clears throat> that they're curating their own media and they're polarizing this country and that uh, we need to, do a much better job of understanding the middle and the facts and less crap. Question number eight. What's the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about making relationships work? I just learned one the other day from my friend, Ben Civit. And he said that he said that he asked one question when his wife comes in hot. Am I listening or am I solving? Isn't that great? That is great. Because I'm a problem solver. My wife comes in and says, blah, blah, blah. I was like, okay, let's just do it. No, 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 I'm like, no, no, no. So the first question you ask is, am I listening or am I solving? Okay. Um, all right. Question number nine. This one's about money. So aside from compound interest, what's the most important or useful thing you've ever learned about money? Boy, other than compound interest, I would say uh, a penny saved is a penny earned. And Franklin. Right yes. There. I'm trying to think of this book I've been, I've been, I've been reading. There's a book called The Psychology of Money. Have you ever read it? Oh, yeah. Morgan Housel. I've interviewed him for the show. I ha- I'm, I'm going to listen to that. That is a brilliant book. I've, I've given out that when you said the first two books I've given out, that's the third one. I've probably given out 100 copies of that book. Like, that I think that's, it's, it is flat out brilliant. That should be required reading for every college student. Yeah. That whole story that he opens with about skipping the gold coins. It's, like, it's amazing, right? Oh, 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 by the way, how about, how about like, hey, this banker, he's living in Greenwich. He's got this big house. And then you got the other guy working at a gas station. And like, and he talks about the guy at the gas station, you know, dies and gives $2 million to the, to the um, local hospital and $4 million to his kids. And the guy in the big mansion, 2008, loses everything. And you're like, right. I love, I love it. Love, 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 love that book. Uh, and at the end, when he gave kind of the condensed history of the economics of the United States, it it's like, unbelievable. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Brilliant, brilliant book. I'm sorry. I can't wait to listen to that episode. Yeah. Okay. So just a few more questions, but I'll ask this here to make sure we get it in. If people want to learn more from you or they want to connect with you, what would you have them do? Go to LinkedIn or Twitter and get me there. At Scott O'Neill and both. Okay. And um, as an expression of gratitude to you for sharing so generously of your knowledge and your experience, 
Um, one thing I've done is I've gone online to the micro lending site, kiva.org, and I've made a micro loan. I won't earn any interest on this. It'll go to the organization to help them fund more of these micro loans. But it's to a, a woman in Liberia. She's 24 years old. She has five kids. But she's going to use this money. Um, oh, and by the way, she went to school only up through seventh grade. But she'll use this money to buy cucumbers, oranges, grapes, apples, and bananas to sell and thereby improve the quality of life in her community and for herself and her family. So thank you for giving me a reason to, to do that. Oh, that's so humbling. Thank you very much. That made my day. I appreciate you changing the world. Yeah, my pleasure. I love to think that our conversation will do good far beyond what we know. I hope it does. I think it will. Me too. So, Okay. Well, Scott, we've covered so much about work, about writing, about mindfulness. Um, what, if anything, haven't we talked about that you want to talk about or you think might be of benefit to, to anyone listening? Well, I have another story from, uh, from our, our, my trip to Mozambique that I want to share. It's, like, it's about cement mixing. I think this is really applicable for your group. So, um, you know, I, I've never made cement before. I don't know if you have, but um, in the U.S., they just have these big bags or 100-pound bags are called quickrete, and you just pour it out and just add water and you have concrete. Um, so we didn't have quick read. So we had just these just huge bags of cement and, you know, see my little hundred pound daughter carrying these 110 bags, pound bags. I was kind of like, way to go kid. But anyway, we're walking like a hundred yards, of these heavy bags and we knock them down and you have to add sand in and you just mix up the sand and then you add water. And, uh, and I, I thought the process was like just fascinating to see. And you just add water and then you have people just raking with, with, um, big heavy shovels and then you know you get the right mix and then you just dump it into the wheelbarrow that i was carrying and um and i and i think about that um for each of us in terms of the water because that's the magic ingredient right and so if you add too much water cement's worthless it just washes away it rolls and eventually it will dry and wreck your lawn and if you don't add enough water it's going to crumble up and it, it's, it's not usable it becomes effectively like cement in the wheelbarrow and and to me that's like our life. And so I guess my parting thought would be is like, what are you adding too much water to in your life? Is it social media? Is it playing video games? Is it uh, Netflix binging? Um, is it, I don't know, the, the baking of the 19th cake this week, you know, all of, of, of which I've seen in my house. And, and what aren't you adding enough water to? Um, that you might think about adding more water to it. Maybe that's meditation, or maybe that's curling up in bed and reading a new book to stretch your mind a little bit. Maybe that's really you hopping on the Peloton and getting your 20 minutes of uh, heart rate going again. You know, maybe that's your gratitude. I mean, whatever, whatever those are, but I, I love it analogously for all of us to be thinking about, you know, what we're adding water, too much water to, and what aren't we adding enough water to. What a great way to visualize that, that idea. And what a wonderful question. Well, Scott, I have really enjoyed getting to know you through reading your book, through this conversation that we've had. I'm really glad you wrote it. Um, I hope everyone listening reads it if they haven't already. And uh, I don't know when or where our paths will cross again, but I know they will. And I'll look forward to the time that they do. I'm looking forward to that as well. Well, once again, I just want to say thank you um, for, for the for the platform for sure, but more importantly for continuing to to bring a message of positivity and hope and mindfulness into the world. We need it more than ever. So thank you. Hey, thanks so much for listening to this episode of the School for Good Living podcast. Before you take off, I just want to extend an invitation to you. Despite living in an age where we have more comforts and conveniences than ever before, life still isn't working for many people. Whether it's here in the developed world where we deal with depression, anxiety, loneliness, addiction, divorce, unfulfilling jobs or relationships that don't work, or in the developing world where so many people still don't have access to basic things like clean water or sanitation or healthcare or education, or they live in conflict zones, there are a lot of people on this planet that life isn't working very well for. If you're one of those people, or even if your life is working, but you have the sense that it could work better, consider signing up for the School for Good Living's Transformational Coaching Program. It's something I've designed 
to help you navigate the transitions that we all go through. Whether you've just graduated or you've gone through a divorce or you've gotten married, headed into retirement, starting a business, been married for a long time, whatever. No matter where you are in life, this nine month program will give you the opportunity to go deep in every area of your life, to explore life's big questions, to create answers for yourself in a community of other growth-minded individuals. And it can help you get clarity and be accountable to realize more of your unrealized potential. It can also help you find and maintain motivation. In short, it's designed to help you live with greater health, happiness, and meaning so that you can be, do, have, and give more. Visit goodliving.com to learn more or to sign up today.